Hello, good morning, everyone. Um, greetings to you from Pataling Jai. It's where I live. Uh, we are currently under the lockdown with MCO. So uh, I'm so sorry I, I can't come to Penang. I've been looking forward to this uh, last two months, preparing to come and enjoy a Cha Kwe Tiao in Penang. But unfortunately, I think maybe the Lord wants me to continue with my diet. We were <laughs> down uh, for months and we we can't go out and the situation in Selangor or where i live uh, has been quite serious as you all hear from the daily um re reports from the government so um it's really um it's almost like ghost town outside um because of the current roadblocks everywhere uh but it's a real joy that i'm still thanks to technology and i'm still able to be uh meeting you all and and catching up with you all, uh, and able to share um, the work today. Um, I'm still trying to get used to uh, speaking over Zoom. Uh, I've done a lot of webinars and forums, but preaching uh, in, in the service over Zoom is also uh, another thing. So I really want to thank uh, Pastor Albert for um, inviting me today. It's a great privilege. To be able to share to you all, and um, I, I'm so I feel so blessed today that um, you invited me to come and share not only about to serve but also to bring the word to you all today. All right, um, now, um, Pastor Albert just now asked me to say something about myself. Well, uh, from I don't know if you uh, he sent my bio out, but uh, I'm yeah, we did. Serving with uh, the Lausanne movement, um, it's been 10 years already uh, that I've been serving as the regional director for Southeast Asia and um, didn't realize that this role, I mean, it's a voluntary role, uh, but it's really taking up uh, more and more time and uh, we will be busy preparing to organize the next Lausanne Congress that's going to take place in 2024. Uh, that will be held in Korea and Japan, but there will be a lot of satellite meetings uh, because uh, the whole world, I think the, the, the evangelical world, they're moving towards polycentric uh, networking uh, with the sharing of ideas and, and um, uh, networking across different ministries, across different regions, and people are just connecting uh, and influencers are connecting all over the world. So uh, it's become polycentric rather than um, centralized in one place or location. So there's a lot of work there, uh, but I'm still serving as the chairman of InterServe. It's a mission organization uh, that was uh, set up um, actually 167 um, years old. I think, yeah, it's uh, almost 170 years. Uh, yeah, it's uh, set up in, started by British women who wanted to go and serve in India and um, to reach out to the uh, illiterate and to do medical work and to, to teach them uh, Bible knowledge. And so it started by some British women and uh, in 1852, and gradually uh, they grew and expanded and um, it became known as um, the Bible and Medical Missionary Fellowship, in short, BMMF. Um, then later on, it changed its name to uh, Inter International Service Fellowship. And then because it was so long, they shortened it to InterServe. Um, uh, after, in the, during the first hundred years of its formation, it was uh, all women missions. Mm. After the hundred years, uh, one of the leaders got married, so they had no choice but to start admitting men. <laughs> and so today we are quite a balanced group of men and women and also children. Um, we have about around a thousand uh, full-time long-term missionaries as well as um, office staff um, and in, in around 20 countries. 
and serving more than 50 countries across Asia and the Arab world. So that's a bit about InterServe, and we're continuing to uh, recruit and place Malaysians uh, who um, to serve in the mission field. Um, we currently, we have uh, still around 40 uh, Malaysians who are serving long time, serving long term in the field, both um, overseas and locally. Um, many of them are actually tent makers or professionals. Some are doing business as missions. Some are using their skills like um, in IT or medical um, or in, some are pastors. So we have a very good mixture of people who are both doing traditional missions as well as non-traditional missions. And um, so uh, we hope that, you know, we will be able to continue mobilizing uh, the Malaysian church uh, to serve in the mission field. So that's about a bit about uh, InterServe and what we do. Um, today, the, the topic of my message is called the reason for missions, and that's God's love for mankind. Now, whenever um, we talk about missions, the first thing that comes into our minds will uh, be the Great Commission. Uh, I mean, the, the, and that's found in Matthew chapter 28. Uh, go into all the world or go to all the nations, you know, and, and preach the gospel, re making disciples of all nations. So that's always in our minds when we talk about missions. Um, however, today, I want to uh, go further than that. I'd like to talk about um, the reason for missions. And uh, today uh, I'm sharing from a passage uh, in the New Testament. It's one of the parables of Jesus that can be found in Luke's gospel. Uh, this is the parable of the Good Samaritan. And this parable is also mentioned in Matthew chapter 22 and um, uh, Mark 12. And this uh, relates to um, the, um, uh, also to the Old Testament. So let me start by showing you a PowerPoint slide, and then you can actually uh, refer to that. Okay. Can everybody see? Yes, yes. Okay, great. All right. Let me just... So the title is called The Reason for Mission, God's Love for Mankind. It's taken from uh, Luke chapter 10, verse 25 to 37. Now, a parable uh, is a fictional oriental story. And usually there's a moral behind the storyline. Um, but, you know, this story of the Good Samaritan is more than just about being kind and doing good to others. And... Therefore, people think that just doing good deeds like the Good Samaritan is all that we need to do in order to be a good Christian. Now, imagine if the whole world was full of Good Samaritans, then the world would be a much better place uh, where people are kind and good to each other. It would be like some kind of utopia, perhaps. Wouldn't that be nice? And there will be so much peace, so much goodness that perhaps even the church need not have to be ex to exist at all. <laughs> but the problem is, you know, many people, when they read this parable, they don't read it properly. And they have not really understood the real context of this passage. And so today, um, I want to share with you this parable, not only as a story about love and compassion or about doing good, but also as a mission story. It's all about God's mission to the people who are lost and people who are in need to be saved. I.e., this is about God's love for mankind. And so let's um, look at the passage together. 
I'm going to uh, read it. And uh, as I read it, you know, um, let's focus and, and reflect on the words that, uh, of this story, shall we? It's taken from, uh, the, I'm going to read from uh, the NIV version, starting from Luke 10, verse 25. So on one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, he replied. How do you read it, he answered. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself. So he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road. And when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a good a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was. And when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn and took care of him. The next day, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? Jesus asked. And the expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. So Jesus told him, go and do likewise. Let's just pause for a moment and pray. Father Lord, we just want to thank you for your word. Father Lord, we pray that your Holy Spirit will open our minds and our hearts to hear what you have to say to each one of us today. Father, we pray that we will learn something new today. Speak to us. Help us to listen and to hear your voice. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now let us unpack this story. And I'd like to give you some background information. Now whenever we read something in the Bible, um, it's always helpful if we ask ourselves some questions. What is the background context? Why did Jesus tell the story in this occasion? To whom is Jesus talking to? Who is the target audience to hear this teaching? And what is the point? What's the point that Jesus is making here? I think there are some interesting background details that we should take note of. First of all, um, this term, uh, love thy neighbor, is mentioned at least eight times in the Old Testament and New Testament. And uh, in the Old Testament, Jews were, uh, were, were actually told to be kind to foreigners and aliens. 
But over time, um, the contemporary Jews during the uh, late Old Testament or early New Testament era began to consider both Gentiles and Samaritans as their enemies. And this term, hate your enemies, was never even mentioned in the Old Testament. It was just built up over the years, over the, 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 the decades, and the Jews began to um, hate them. And so it became something hearsay, uh, and it got passed down to, to different, uh, various generations. And gradually, it became a very common negative attitude of the Jews towards others during the time of Jesus. That's why um, Jesus in Matthew chapter five, verse 43, he reminded people to um, love their enemies and pray for those who persecute them. So uh, we need to really uh, ask the right questions to get the right answers. And, oh, and here in this story, it all started with a question posed to Jesus by uh, this teacher in law. This conversation started um, with uh, this teacher in law trying to play a trick. In fact, he was trying to test Jesus. It was a trick question. And, you know, most of the time, we Christians, we just take things for granted with, about what we read or what we hear. And we never we, we, we uh, forget to really think and ask questions. Uh, we forget to think critically and ask the right questions, the important questions. This is what we call uh, critical thinking. So here, um, you, we have this teacher in law uh, asking Jesus a very critical question about life. He asked, what must I do to be able to live? I think as Christians ourselves, uh, we ourselves also need to ask such important questions about life in eternity. How do we get eternal life? Now, who is Jesus talking to? He's not only talking uh, to this teacher, um, um, the law, but he was obviously surrounded by his disciples and he was also surrounded uh, by other um, Jews who were uh, standing, uh, standing around. And of course, you have the hypocritical religious people who were trying to expose them. For, for a long time, they have been questioning Jesus' teachings and they've been trying to find fault with him. They all had the wrong motives and they were trying to justify themselves. Uh, they were jealous of Jesus. They hated him. So that's why they are trying to find ways and means to bring down Jesus, to accuse him of blasphemy, to accuse him of going against the law. And here we have the Apostle Luke who recorded the story. And I believe that he recorded it not only for Jews for, to hear, but it's for Christians to hear the story so that it will remind us not to be, not to make the same hypocritical mistakes, just like the teacher in law or Pharisees or those other Jews who were so religious but trying to bring down Jesus. But Jesus knew clearly what they were up to. And that's why Jesus threw back the question at him. And he says, let's go back to the Old Testament scriptures or the word of God. What does the word of God say about this? Now, nobody, not a single uh, Jew or a teacher in law would ever dare to ask a question or to or dispute what the scriptures says, because the scriptures is the very word of God that they all have to obey and, and, and um, 
it's sacred to them. So Jesus knew that they were trying to trick him to say something different from the law. And in reply, in response, Jesus uses the scriptures from the Old Testament to answer his question. Basically, Jesus was saying, your scripture is the same scripture as mine. He accepted the Jewish scriptures as true, and therefore the teacher in law could not accuse Jesus of making up his own ideas or teachings, which might be different from the written Jewish laws. So Jesus was able to prove that he was not a false teacher, neither was he a heretic, or was he making up his false teachings. So according to the uh, Bible scholars, there are more than 600 laws, in fact, 613 commandments. And then you have the 10 big commandments, which can all be summarized further down to two requirements. And these are, these are combined as what we call the greatest commandment. And this is taken from Deuteronomy uh, chapter 6, verse 5, and Leviticus 19, verse 18. Basically, they say, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. So the first big question that um, the teacher in law had was, what must I do to live? What is the single action that I must do, he was asking. And the teacher in law was focusing on one single action. He meant it for only one time. But Jesus says, you must do this. And Jesus was meaning, you must do it all the time. Every moment, you must do it continuously. You must never stop doing that. So what Jesus said was absolutely correct. Just do that and do it all the time. Follow that and do it. Don't stop doing it. And loving your neighbor as yourself, as you know, is commonly known as the second commandment. And it's part of the greatest commandment. And unfortunately, um, this is often overlooked by many Christians and especially as a great commission theme. Now, when Jesus says, you have to do this all the time, the lawyer or his teacher in law knows very well, um, what is Jesus asking him to do? Now, can any one of us here today and honestly say that we have loved God with all our hearts, with our soul, with our strength, and with our minds. You and I know that if we try to do this uh, and to go to heaven, we know that we can never achieve it. It's impossible. And the teacher-in-law knew it. So this teacher-in-law, because he was so proud, he was not satisfied. He still wanted to trap Jesus. And uh, so he continues to ask the second question. So tell me, who's my neighbor? And I will do it. Now, if Jesus has said, your neighbor is so-and-so, I think... That would have been an easy uh, answer and, and a very good answer. And I will just do that. However, the Lord didn't define it. And nor did he say, who is the neighbor? Most of all, he didn't even mention that he's a fellow Jew. Instead, he starts uh, answering the question, by telling a story, 
as what we've read just now. And uh, you and I know, well, there are between Jerusalem and Jericho, I think um, some of you may have visited the Holy Land. Uh, it's um, a distance of about 15 miles. It's a really dangerous road since the time of Jesus. And it still continues to be a dangerous uh, road today. Um, during that time of Jesus, there are always robbers hidden along the road, waiting to prey and pounce on the victims to rob them. So um, this guy who was robbed, he's probably a Jewish guy, and he shouldn't have gone uh, along this road by himself. He should have gone together with a group of people instead of going alone. And in this story, Jesus purposely included the Samaritan. Now, the Jews hated the Samaritans and regarded them as unclean. And, 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 and likewise, the Samaritans also regarded the same about the Jews. Who are the Samaritans? Uh, the Samaritans are actually descendants of the Jews who were taken into captivity uh, by the Assyrians to Babylon. And they themselves also claim to be true sons of Israel. And they also worship one God. So they are monotheistic. Um, they believe in the Torah. But however, they consider Mount Gerizim as their sacred place of worship instead of Jerusalem. Now, normally, um, if you want to travel a straight line uh, between Jerusalem and Jericho, um, it would be short. And however, you have to pass through um, dangerous um, area and um, you want to avoid passing through Samaria and you want to avoid bumping into any Samaritans. But ironically, in this story, um, Jesus says, uh, included the Samaritan. And the very person you want to avoid turns out to be a Samaritan. And he was the one who turns out to be the kind person who helped this Jewish man who was robbed and attacked and uh, he was in need. So when Jesus asked the teacher in law, who is the neighbor? He refused to answer. He, he refused and he would not answer or mention the word Samaritan because deep down in his heart, this Jewish man hated the Samaritans. So all he could say was, uh, the one who acted in mercy. So Jesus told him to just do that. Notice that this Samaritan, well, this lawyer did not even ask what loving God is like, which is the first part of the uh, greatest commandment. He was asked about loving the neighbor. And um, so I think this was a difficult question for him to answer because um, God, Jesus was really asking him, you know, uh, they can be so righteous, they can be so religious. And sometimes uh, we as Christians, we can be so diligent in doing our work, our ministry, that we're focusing more on the ministry rather than focusing on following God's uh, commandments. God only wants our attention. He wants us to give our love to him. And he wants us to love our neighbors as ourselves. It's, it's I think all of us here will find it difficult to follow uh, this commandment. And, uh, and Jesus knows that. 
God knew it. And uh, here we have the teacher-in-law, instead of admitting and accepting it that he can never do it, he could never uh, fulfill and obey uh, the greatest commandment, no matter how hard he tries. And it's the same with us. We as Christians, we still continue to sin every day. We can never uh, obey and fulfill uh, the, the greatest commandment um, each, each day. Um, and we, are, we continue to break uh, the rules and break the laws. So here we have the um, teacher of law who found it so difficult. Now, I'd like to, um, you to consider now uh, this story and think through what are the key missional themes that we find. I think we can find um, some very clear themes with uh, key missional applications and metaphors uh, from this story. Here, uh, we have um, we, uh, Jesus talk about the whole law. Um, they challenge the traditional way of thinking of Jesus, uh, of, of, um, of the church. Um, and they challenge us as Christians to think about the, how do we fulfill the law? Jesus said it very clearly in Matthew chapter 5, uh, verse 17. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law of the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. So we, I think we need to think about how we as Christians can apply the key message of Jesus in the church and within ourselves. Let's look at um, um, the first and probably the, the easiest, uh, the, the most obvious um, theme. And that's obeying God's commandment means putting love into action. Now, in this story, you have both the priest and Levi. They took the easy way out and assumed that no one was looking. There was no one around. So they left the poor man there and, 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 and to die. Um, they, they weren't willing to stop to help him. They were, I guess they were more concerned about staying clean. Clean, that means they staying kosher. Uh, so that they continue to go back to work in their temples and to show off outwardly how strictly they have kept the rules of the law. Because, you know, for a Jew, if they touch a man who was dead, now this poor man was not moving, so he could possibly be dead. And for the Jewish people, if they touch a dead body, they themselves will become unclean. And that means that they are, will not be able to serve in the temple. They will have to go through a time of cleansing. And um, that means that they will have no income. But here, they have a dilemma. Because the word of God also says you've got to help those who are needy. So they had to choose between should they help someone in need or should they obey the law and stay clean? So they took the easy way out. But their actions really show that inwardly, their hearts did not have love or compassion for the one who is in need. I think saving a life would have been far more important than keeping oneself clean. Now, many of us 
uh, will probably have heard this quote, preach the gospel, use words if necessary. Uh, it's actually taken from a quote of St. Francis of Assisi. And this really talks about doing holistic missions. And that means preaching the gospel is not just about proclamation in word, or, but is also to proclaim in deed, in doing, in action, by serving people and living out an exemplary life uh, as a Christian um, in order to be a good witness and testimony for Jesus Christ. And obedience to God's commandment means putting love into action. It's not just empty talk. We must walk the talk. We all hear that often. And uh, we need to uh, make sure that faith and action will go together. And doing missions must be motivated by love for God and for people. It's not about showing off. It's not about our own righteous pride. It's not about doing something out of obligation. And neither is it doing it for a position or for a status. Now in Corinthians chapter 13, the Apostle Paul reminds us that the act of showing love is not about making sound or clanging symbols, you know, which is drawing attention to, to himself. You're not supposed to be doing it to receive praises of men. Today, um, we need to serve. We have many mission partners uh, who are doing all kinds of holistic work and using their professions in education, in medical work, in theological teaching and training, doing church work. Some are doing business. Uh, some are doing IT and admin and, and media and all sorts of uh, professions. Many of them are working in hard places. We call them uh, places where uh, it's very difficult, where they cannot even share the good news openly. All they can do is do their work well and be good salt and light so that people can see Christ through their lives. Some are involved in refugee work, uh, some are in community development, uh, teaching, and some are also doing uh, business in the marketplace. And wherever they work, they are touching lives so that people can see the love of Christ in them. And we don't need to have to go overseas to do that. We can do that here, even um, back home, locally in Malaysia. You know, we have our own workplaces. And, and even at home, you know, if Christians can show the love of Christ uh, in themselves, um, then you know, we can create huge impact and touch people's lives. I like the quote by Mahatma Gandhi. Um, he said, I like your Christ. I do not like your Christians. Your Christians are so unlike your Christ. Now imagine if Gandhi had um, become a Christian because of Christian witness. Then I think today the country of India will not be a stronghold of Hinduism anymore. Well, at least that's what I think. I don't know if you agree or not. So when we want to obey God's commandments, we've got to make sure that we really put love into action, just like this Samaritan. Now, obeying God's commandments also requires taking risk. Here in this story, the Samaritan took unnecessary risk on the dangerous road, unlike the priest or the Levite. Because if he had helped this man, he will be slowed down and he might also get robbed by bandits uh, along the way. Now, when we want to love someone and demonstrate love, uh, it often requires taking some form of risk. Risk of being cheated. We risk being rejected. Uh, we risk uh, being taken advantage of. Maybe we 
we would be put into some kind of danger or a loss. We could get hurt, maybe not physically, but emotionally or financially. We may even get persecuted. And lastly, we may even lose our lives. So therefore, doing missions in love is very risky business. Um, in the old days, when we think about um, Western missionaries who went to the mission field, they used to go um, not expecting to survive or return back to their homeland. Many uh, have perished at sea or died of illness or they got killed by the local natives. Therefore, if you want to think about doing missions, whether locally or overseas, there are always some risks involved. And today, we still have mission workers who risk their lives in the hard places like war zones and harsh conditions. Some have been threatened, some have been kidnapped and killed even in the process of uh, the field. Um, I remember about 10, 11 years ago, um, one of our mission agency partners, he was an uh, eye doctor named Dr. Tom Little. He was working in Afghanistan and living there for many, many years, uh, providing medical care for the Afghans. And on one of his um, outreaches uh, to, to provide uh, medical eye care um, he, with a team, the entire team were all killed by bandits. So the, so the volunteer doctors and, and staff, uh, you know, who went along with him to conduct eye clinics were all killed. He and his family, you know, have lived and served the Afghans so lovingly for so many years, nearly 40 years. But even after his death, his wife Libby, she went back to Afghanistan and continued serving uh, the Afghan people despite what happened because she never lost her first love for the Afghan people. And when I think about uh, risk, taking risks for the gospel, I remember uh, my friend, uh, Brother Haik Jose Pian, who was the general superintendent of the church, um, Assemblies of God Church in Iran. Uh, during the 1980s, 90s, he was campaigning for the release uh, of uh, his fellow pastor, uh, Pastor Mehdi Dibaj, uh, who was in prison for his faith. Um, I met with um, both Pastor Haik and uh, Mehdi Dibaj. Um, and I, I still remember one thing that um, Pastor Haik told me when I asked him uh, about this, his campaign. And he said, you know, he would risk being arrested and getting persecuted for his actions. But he told me this thing. He said, I will not stop proclaiming the gospel because I love my people and they need to hear the good news of Jesus Christ. One day he went out of the house and was missing for several days. And later his body was found somewhere in the park with multiple, multiple stab wounds in his heart. Brother Hyde was killed because he wouldn't stop preaching the good news to his fellow countrymen. He had counted the cost and he was willing to risk his life for the sake of the gospel. And that's because he loved his people. He loved his neighbors. And today we hear uh, and read many reports of how the church in Iran is growing so fast. And not only in Iran, but amongst the diaspora Iranians. It's just like what Tertullian uh, said in the second century, He's one of the famous uh, fathers of the church, early church. 
He said, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. So when we want to uh, obey God's commandment, um, we may have to take risks. Of course, there will be fear. There will be concerns. But the writers of Hebrews in chapter 11, verse 1 says, Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. So if we have faith and if we trust God, then we will obey his commandments, even though it may require taking some risks. Thirdly, um, obeying God's commandments means overcoming prejudices. Now, you and I we hear and we experience a lot of prejudice and discrimination, even in this country. There could be racial discrimination, there would be cultural, language, uh, or religious, or social class. Uh, sometimes it's political beliefs. Uh, sometimes because of nationality, or because of gender, and, and because of age. And these are often the major barriers to loving uh, uh, one's neighbor. And therefore, this will prevent us from uh, being effective in our missions. In this story that Jesus told, the priests and Levite, they were both prejudiced and hated the Samaritans and vice versa. And yet, the Samaritan who came along, he overlooked all these prejudices and helped out this Jewish person who was in need. He didn't care about race or religion. He didn't even care about whether he would become unclean or not. So, we, even as Christians, I think many times we continue to um, or fail in our obedience of this commandment. Uh, Jesus said very clearly, love your enemies and even pray for those who persecute you. I think this um, uh, can be commandment can be quite sobering for us, especially here um, in Malaysia. We hear of many incidences uh, uh, of how uh, the mates, foreign workers are abused and mistreated. And now with recently uh, with the COVID problem, uh, we they are often blamed. So we really need to be honest with ourselves and really need to repent in our hearts. We really need to change and, and, and ask God to forgive us. Today, uh, the Christian population makes up 9% of this country. We're a minority. How are we going to reach out and touch the lives of the majority people if we still continue to have prejudice within us, how can they really truly see the love of Christ uh, in us so that they will believe in what we believe? How do we treat our mates? How do we treat our foreign laborers? Let's just be honest and ask our own, own selves and reflect Sometimes it's even shown in the way we talk, in our language, um, the way um, we, our attitudes towards them. The next theme we find is that obeying God's commandment means being totally committed. Now, obedience to the greatest commandment and the great commission requires commitment on the part of the church and the individual Christian. We cannot be half-hearted or lukewarm as, as Christians. Instead, we must be committed, just like the soldier 
carrying out his orders. He doesn't get involved in civilian matters. He just strictly follow the orders of uh, his superiors. And, and um, or we, we must be like a runner who is running the race to, to the finishing line. Um, these, we can find um, the Apostle Paul uh, telling us what it is to be committed uh, to the gospel, to finishing the task. Jesus is really looking for people to be committed disciples, committed with all their hearts, souls, strength, and minds. Now, obeying God's commandments also means giving of one's resources. Here, the Samaritan was totally committed, uh, um, not only committed to helping the man, uh, he paid enough um, and even extra over and above what he needed to do. Um, the priests and the Levites, they were more concerned about their financial losses if they were not able to serve in the temple uh, due to being unclean. And the process of cleansing would take days. And hence, they won't be able to uh, serve until the process is completed. But here, we have the Samaritan who not only sacrificed his own time, but he also paid the bills for this man who was in need. Now, one denarii is equivalent to one day's wages for a labor. So doing missions is not cheap. It requires resources. I remember one of uh, our mission partner who served in uh, Afghanistan and Pakistan uh, once told me, we, Christ we missionaries do not live on fresh air and water. In fact, Many of us serve in hard places where there is no clean air or clean water. Now, God has given us as stewards, uh, good stewards. We have many talents. We have many giftings and many resources that we can use to help build his kingdom. So uh, whatever we do for these people, Jesus said, you know, one of these who are the least of these brothers of mine, you are doing it for me. Now, giving of resources doesn't necessarily mean uh, it's money. It could be your time. It could be your talents. It could be your giftings. Uh, and you could support people uh, who are serving him in ministry. Um, you can also do it through your own finances or even through prayers. Prayers is, is, a, is a big resource. And a lot of our missionaries, they, all of them, in fact, they depend on prayers. So doing missions is not cheap. But we need to remember, salvation is not cheap either. There's always a cost involved. Going out to the mission field will require many costs. Uh, we, we need to buy air tickets. We need to pay for accommodation, for meals, for travel insurance. And there are many other expenditures. And if you're going for long-term missions, you can only do that if the church or a group of supporters will come behind them to support them uh, financially and in prayer. Now, Jesus has called many people to go out into the mission field. But unfortunately, not everyone is able to respond to the calling. Why is that? And that's because of the lack of support. Now, perhaps some of you amongst us here uh, may have this calling to provide support or give things to help and serve those missionaries who are all in need. Now, obeying God's commandments also means bringing healing and reconciliation. The Samaritan in this story. He cleaned the wounds. He bandaged and made sure that this um, Jewish man was taken care of before he went away. Now, ministering in godly love can really bring about physical healing, emotionally, uh, and, and also spiritual healing. We're talking about both inner and outer healing. 
and we are also often talking about forgiveness and reconciliation. Therefore, doing medical missions and healing ministries or caring ministries are very effective ways to extend God's kingdom. And I think um, during the current COVID crisis that we're in, uh, although it's a crisis, but it also means opportunities for the church to demonstrate the love of Christ. There are many ways the church can help the community and serve them, whether it's by helping with food, with, uh, with um, assistance or, or volunteering um, at the hospitals and, and so on. Um, we, can, we can show Christ in our lives and touch the lives so that the communities will also be touched and be transformed. It's interesting, if you read uh, Luke 10, verse 9, just before Jesus talks about this story of the Good Samaritan, he, mentioned, he sent out uh, a group of uh, short-term missionaries, two by two, and he, one of the instructions he gave was, heal the sick and tell them the kingdom of God is near you. Now, why is it he never said, preach the gospel and then heal the sick. But instead, you know, he said, heal the sick first. Maybe, um, and I suspect this is a very good strategy, how to be sharing the gospel in touching lives. And in InterServe, we started uh, many, uh, sending many medical missionaries but today there are still a lot of opportunities to be involved in medical and relief work in missions. As I mentioned just now, we started almost 170 years ago as a Bible and medical mission. And today um, we still have so many opportunities, especially during this current pandemic. So let's consider how God can use us uh, to bring healing reconciliation to people. Finally, Jesus paid a debt that he did not owe. And we owed a debt that we could not pay. The Samaritan not only helped the man who didn't deserve his help at all, he even promised to come back again. And that's really an act of mercy. It was totally undeserved at all. And I'm sure it sounds familiar to you. Jesus paid for our sins with his own life on the cross to give us salvation, which we do not deserve at all. So that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. John 3.16. That's familiar, isn't it? So that's the grace and mercy of Jesus' salvation, salvation message. God so loved the world that he gave us Jesus to die for our sins. And Jesus even promised to come back again. Maranatha, the Lord comes. So to summarize, loving our neighbor as ourselves will involve these things. We need to put love into action. We need to walk the talk. Um, and to be salt and light. We also need to take risks. We need to be prepared to take risks and trust God. Do not let fear prevent us from serving him or his people. We need to overcome our prejudices and discriminations. God wants the gospel to be preached to everyone, regardless of race, religion, color, gender, or age. We're not told to preach only or to love only those people whom we love, but to everyone. And we need to show total commitment, just like the Samaritan who, came, who was committed to come back for the man who was he had helped. We mustn't be lukewarm or half-hearted. We need to be fully committed as Christians. And we need to think about giving of resources, of our resources. After all, 
They're all given to us by the Lord. They're provided by God. So what is so much to give some back to God's work? We need to be generous stewards of uh, these resources. Some people are willing to give up all just to follow Jesus. Then we have medical healing and reconciliation ministries. Uh, the Good Samaritan is a good example of how uh, we can do that. And finally, this is a reminder of God's love for mankind and about how Christ sacrificed his life for us to save us. So let us pause and ponder on the critical questions. Imagine if Jesus was asking you today, who is your neighbor? Have you been a neighbor? How can you become a neighbor to others? How do you love your neighbor as yourself? How much do you love your neighbors as yourself? We need to be honest with ourselves as a church and as individual Christians. Have we really obeyed this commandment to love our neighbors as ourselves? In John chapter 13, verse 34 and 35, Jesus says, A new commandment I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know you are my disciples, if you have loved one another. Now, what if you say that, oh, you know, I can't love my neighbor. I cannot forgive my enemies. I've never really experienced the fullness of God's love. Well, if you're struggling with this, let me say to you, Jesus has promised that you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. So we need to invite the Holy Spirit uh, in faith to change your hearts and to fill it with love and forgiveness. And then we can find inner healing. We can find the power to forgive and to love even our enemies as much as we love ourselves. And if we allow him to do this, Christ can transform us and we can, our lives will be transformed by him. So we need to encounter Christ. We need to let the Holy Spirit by the supernatural power to fill us with this love, even though mentally, emotionally, physically, we can't do it by ourselves. We need to surrender totally to, the, to God, to the Holy Spirit, and he can change us. But only if we allow him to do that. So let's conclude this morning. Let's take a time to consider these uh, points that I shared. First of all, if you want to love God and also love your own neighbor, these two cannot be separated from one another. They are both essential parts of one's worship of the great and loving God. The greatest commandment is actually um, a summary of the entire law or the Ten Commandments altogether. You will find that in the, in the beginning, all the, the commandments of the Ten Commandments are talking about worship and love for the Lord, for God. And then you have um, the later part, it relates to parents and others. So it, it's all summarized in these uh, greatest commandments. And without genuine love for our neighbor, our worship will not be pleasing to God. We can worship God all we want. We can sing to him. We can pray to him. And 
and do as much worship to God. But if we fail in loving our neighbor, then our worship is not complete. It will not please God. And likewise, if we want to do missions and, and be a witness, we will not be effective or powerful because the love is not there in our hearts. Therefore, our love for our neighbor must really be authentic, truly authentic and genuine from our hearts. So in John 3, 16, Jesus said, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, and whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. So this is the very reason for doing missions. It's all because of God's love for mankind, for you and me. And that's why we're given the Great Commission. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. It's no longer I that lives, but Christ who lives in me what the Apostle Paul says. And that's what we are called to, to be, to, to let Christ be reflected in our lives so that our love will touch lives and communities so that we can do missions uh, wherever we may be, whether locally or overseas. And with the Holy Spirit empowering us, we can overcome all kinds of barriers or prejudice and guide us and help us and empower us to love our neighbors as ourselves. I'd like to close uh, with just a short prayer. Let's pray. Father Lord, thank you for reminding us this morning of your love for mankind, for each one of us here today. And that's why we're doing missions. That's why we are called to do missions, not for our own glory, but to give all glory to you. Help us, O oh Lord, to have a fresh understanding of who you are and what your mission is. Help us who are struggling with um, prejudice, discrimination, racism, anger, unforgiveness. With all our different issues and challenges, especially even during this time with COVID and, and, and so many difficulties, Father, Lord, I just really want to pray that you help us to put your love into action. I pray, Lord, that you will grant each one of us a fresh anointing, a fresh touch, and also a fresh release of your love, your forgiving love. Help us restore relationships even with those whom we have issues with. Help us, Lord, fill us with your Holy Spirit. Empower us. Speak into our lives. Speak into our hearts, our minds, our entire being. And replace whatever is not good with your love. Fill us with your love for our neighbors. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you very much. Pass it Amen. To Amen. Um, to Albert.